We have lost the war against microtransactions in MMORPGs, and you and I are actually in part to blame. But the thing is, we might actually be able to fix it. This question is, do we even want to? When a game that hasn't even released yet is selling packages that cost more than the annual salary of many of us, myself included, it's probably time for a little bit of just, just a little bit of retrospection. But wait, but wait, you say, because there's other games, my favorite game, my MMO of choice, it doesn't sell gear, it sells boosts, sure, it sells a couple level boosts, and I guess there's a, there's a whole lot of cosmetics that it sells, and there's this, this little weird thing where you have to like put in like all these enchantments and you have to pay for the enchantments, but, but it's not pay to win. Because you see, what we're doing now with this argument is spending a lot more time arguing over what the definition of pay to win is and actually arguing against microtransactions. We spend all of our time and energy doing that. And just to reiterate here, yes, I am absolutely 100% part of this problem. Not only have I engaged with multiple different purchasing of boosts and things like that in games like EverQuest, from games like EverQuest to, to really anything that has some kind of experience boost, I've also released videos like this one where I mentioned that I actually don't mind boosts like experience boosts, like 10%, 20%, 50% experience boosts versus things like cosmetics. But the context of that, the context of those arguments about pay to win are more about, you know, trying to find out, well, this is what we have. This is what the gaming landscape is now. Before we get into all the ways that the new desolate landscape of games and MMORPGs with microtransactions is our fault, I need to tell you how it's not. The specific parts of it that are not our fault. The parts where we are being tricked into spending more money. Things that are being used, marketing tactics that are constantly being used, really just to, to just drive it home just a little bit more. The most frustrating part of it for me. MMORPGs have always been highly monetized. Something that's easy to forget when we look at the current landscape of MMORPGs. With EverQuest 2 doing this crap and Star Citizen's ridiculous bundle with the price that has so much sticker shock that I may pass out. Oh, and, and quick side note here, thank you to Blizzard for releasing the $64 horse that costs more than the actual game as I was writing this script. You truly are the gift that keeps on giving. Here I was worried that I wouldn't have enough examples of egregious pricing, but you came in clutch as usual, riding over, over that, that hill like Gandalf in Lord of the freaking rings. As pointed out in PC Gamer in a great article on price anchoring, something that I didn't actually know the terminology for before this video, it also demonstrated some of the marketing psychology used not just in video games for microtransactions, but in most things you encounter in our society. Price anchoring is essentially the use of a high priced item to make the lower priced item seem more attractive. Tell someone that a horse in Diablo 4 costs $25 and they may think that's high. It is. Tell someone they could get the $25 horse for the $65 horse with the same currency, well, that $25 horse is now anchored by the higher price. Instead of one stupidly expensive thing, it is two stupidly expensive things, but one of them is slightly cheaper than the other stupid one. And all you gotta do then is just throw in a little bit of like crazy in-game currencies that use math against you. We'll stick with Diablo 4 here since they are the one bundling this currency with the horse. Blizzard sells platinum in packs of 500, 1,000, 2,800, 5,700, 11,500, and 18,500 with their respective pricing. For this, we're going to focus on the 500, 1,000, and 2,800 currency tiers. As you notice, we get from the 500 and 1,000 to 2,800 is only $25, which actually seems like a bargain. For this, we're going to focus on the 500, 1,000, and 2,800 dollar tiers, and you'll see why here in just a second because it gets more confusing when you look at some of the item costs in the store. The Lion of Arias costume costs 2,200 platinum. Now see, I really, really wanted to be Hercules in Diablo 4, and this was the best way to do it. But damn, that cost, it just doesn't quite line up with the packages, does it? 
they they don't have a simple package that I could purchase for 2200 platinum and they don't allow me to purchase by the 100s the thing that would make the most sense right because if you're selling 500 platinum for five dollars why can't I buy a hundred platinum for one dollar because they want you to buy more I could either buy the 2,500 Platinum for $25 using the 1,500 packs, or I could get a bonus. I could get 2,800 Platinum for the same freaking price. That's such a deal. That's such a fantastic deal. I'm getting an extra 300 Platinum. Of course, I'm gonna go for that one. So now I go and buy my Lion of Ariat Cosmetics and I'm Hercules. Okay, so that leaves me with 600 platinum left over, and of course, my awesome new cosmetic. But now I see the Death Toll armor set, and that's just, I mean, that's just so freaking cool. I can basically be Skeletor. Who doesn't want to be Skeletor? There's only one problem. It costs 2400 platinum. I still have 600 platinum left over, so I could just buy two 1000 packs for $20 but then I'd have 2,600 platinum. That covers the armor with some <laughs> left over, but if I'm spending $20 already, why not just spend the extra $5 and get the 2,800 platinum pack again? That way I'm getting the bonus 300 platinum. It's just a better deal. It makes more sense, it's more value. So a lot of this logic is going to rely on this idea of value. This thing, this, this idea that you're getting more value by spending more. And that's why you they have it separate. Like you're getting plus 300 for free. Bonus, bonus for buying this. But it's also there to make sure that you kind of tend to have a balance. A balance that encourages you to spend more money. So I go ahead and purchase the same pack, the 2800 to get my bonus, to get my extra 300 because if I was going to spend $20, then I might as well have spent the 25, right? Well, now I have both sets of armor and I also have a thousand platinum left over. And so I've got this, this thousand platinum just kind of burning, sitting there in my wallet. It's a bit balanced. That's just like, it stares at me every single time I log in. So I figure why not? Let's, let's, let's spend this thousand so that it's not just there. I mean, I might as well. Otherwise that's like $10 just like, like lost, right? It's a sunk cost. So I, I, I go and try and find something to spend it on. And I, as I'm looking through it, I, I want to spend on something, not no longer just something that's going to be, you know, more cosmetics. I want something that's actually going to help me in game. So I look at the battle pass and yes, here we go. Fantastic. The battle pass is only a thousand coins and I have exactly that much left over. But but wait, there's another battle pass. But there's a, there's another battle pass. There's another one just, just right over. It's 2800 platinum and it, God, it has so many cool like they have mounts. They're giving away so much in that extra battle pass and it's only 1800 coins more, only 1800 more than the, the 1000 I already have. So I could go and buy another $20 worth of packs and I could get it. But then I'd have 200 left over. And um, I mean, if. if there's got there's another way that I could do this, right? Like I'm mean, how how else I can't get to 1800. And I don't want to spend $20 because if I spend 25 I get the the bonus. Therein lies a lot of the problem. It is constantly in different ways trying to encourage you to spend more money with with this idea that you're getting more value by spending more money and this constant balance encouraging you to just just spend it. But when you do spend it, you usually will not have the ability to buy the exact amount. There will, of course, be times where that's not the case. Like, for example, the thousand dollar battle pass was the exact cost. But then the armored pieces of twenty two hundred and twenty four hundred were not. They were separate. There's this constant push and pull of trying to make sure you either have a balance or consider upping to the next highest thing to get that little bit of extra bonus. The easiest way would have just been make it so you can buy one to one. That doesn't work that way. But wait, there's one more tactic here that we really kind of we talk about because 
not only is this all these these marketing tactics to get you to buy more and more and more because you have left over and all the mathematics are not working out in your favor they're working out in the favor of blizzard well there's also the whole part of fomo fear of missing out because the way that the store works is it cycles through things now granted they knew not to just like remove things automatically that would piss players off as we have seen that before we have seen players get very mad when you have things on the store cosmetics even that are retired in the store and never come back because it is a very strong fomo pull it's trying to pull on your desire to look like skeletor so what they did instead was it'll come back don't know when definitely comes back though at some point but you better get it now before it before it goes away gotta get it before because it could be it could be weeks it could be days it could be months it'll come back we just don't know when fomo more fomo finding a little loophole around what we as gamers have said well that shit's bad and yes i do of course understand that diablo 4 is not an mmo it is an online role-playing game, but it is not an, a massively role-playing game, but you could apply the same things that Blizzard is using here to a lot of MMOs, like Neverwinter or EverQuest. Yes, EverQuest, the game that I love so much, does a lot of the same shit, and it's really frustrating. So you've got FOMO, you've got sunk costs, you've got price anchoring, you've got cosmetics, you've got all this bullshit all rolled into one. But according to Blizzard, and according to many of you and myself, this actually isn't pay to win. It's pay for I guess, somewhat useless things. But, you know, I mentioned EverQuest, and perhaps there's no finer example of price anchoring than what EverQuest has been doing recently, in re early in recent years, with their expansions. We're looking at their latest expansion, Larian's Song. It costs a pretty reasonable $34.99. Their collector's edition costs $69.99. Nice. Go back to a decade or so, and that's all pretty standard. You had the standard price and then some collector's edition with additional things. Go back another decade and that collector's edition actually came with physical things like, you know, a cloth map or maybe some keychains and shit. All things that obviously weren't worth the price, but that was part of it. You were collecting. Now, not only has it moved to the digital space with collectibles being things like experience boosts and satchels or mounts, but they've taken it even further. Now you can also get the premium upgrade to your digital edition for $139.99. If you're keeping track of that math, that is over $100 more than the actual expansion costs. But wait, we still have one more option. The family and friends option highlighted with an exciting new features banner. What are those features though? Well, essentially, it's a bunch of crap that you can sell to all those people that didn't actually buy the really expensive versions of the game. And for the opportunity to price gouge all your friends in game, all you gotta do is spend a not insignificant amount of money, like, you know, $249 for their original expansion that cost $34. $200 more. Yay. It even comes, it even comes with a it even comes with the level 100 character boost. But hey, when you look at those prices, when you look at those really high prices, the $34.99 doesn't seem bad anymore, does it? It seems pretty, pretty okay. Hell, I mean, you know what? Hell, that $70, the, the $70 dollar, dollar collector's edition, you get some extra stuff with it. So that's, that's pretty good, actually, isn't it? It's not bad at all compared to the $100 plus one or the $200 plus one. Oh, but Dark Paw, you're not off the hook yet because I haven't talked about this yet, because I thought you were done, but you're not. Because it seems like you're using EverQuest 2. It seems like you're using EverQuest 2 as a testing ground, you know, the lesser known EverQuest, for to kind of see what we'll tolerate. And it's showing that we're not willing to tolerate much more than you're already doing. I will say, before we get into this, that I do genuinely believe that Gen Chan has been a good thing 
for EverQuest. I think that the game has gone in a positive direction since they took over, since basically they are moved away from Columbus Nova. But damn, this has not been great the last, like basically the last year uh, with EverQuest 2. The too long didn't read on this one comes from MMO Bomb on the reporting on EverQuest 2's recent Dark Paw Hero adventuring boosts, something that they added to the cash shop. And as they say in the article, a character boost is on its own is not something that's really all that all that newsworthy. Which kind of shows where the, the state of the MMO genre at the moment. But what the issue with this is, what, what people are so upset about, is the fact that the boost includes a currency. Not just any currency, a currency that was recently nerfed in-game shortly before this thing went on the store. The common thought there is, they are manipulating the drop rates of something that would be earned in-game to make it more attractive to spend real-world money to purchase it out of game. It just comes across as kind of kind of frustrating. It's not the, the worst thing they've done. And this was also announced while I was writing the script for this video. But hey, at least it's not as bad as what EverQuest 2 was doing before with what was not so affectionately called essentially pay to raid. And damn, that does not sound great, does it? But this is kind of the state of the MMO genre. We lost when it comes to monetization. We ceded so much ground that we forgot where the lines were. <laughs> they have become so heavily monetized to the point of absolute exhaustion. I, I'm exhausted. This video is making me exhausted. We end up often defending the monetization of one MMO because it's less egregious than this MMO. But if we go back a couple years, the one we're defending, we'd probably have been really upset about. But this is where I'm going to kind of take it a turn a little bit, change a little bit of the, the narrative here. Because if we go back, there's some things we really need to understand about MMORPGs. When MMORPGs first came out decades ago, they were already really heavily monetized. You were being asked to pay a box price and a monthly subscription that was roughly one sixth or more of the cost of the game every single month and then pay for expansions that may or may not come out every year or every few years. In a single year of playing an MMO, you could potentially be paying up to $270 for that one game. And that's assuming a new player buying the game for $60, paying $15 a month for a subscription, and getting the end of the year new expansion for around $30. And then the next year, the same single player might pay another $210 and then another $180 the third year if they skip an expansion. All of that is with no microtransactions. MMOs have always been expensive, and there's a reason for that, of course. There is, a, there is this, this contract you make with the creator of the games, this contract that I'm going to continue to give you money to make sure that you continue to develop this game because this game is a persistent world that continues and goes on. In, in general, the idea was kind of attractive to both the players as well as the, the teams making the game. Why, why do you think so many, so many games now are looking at becoming live service games? A game that keeps making money. So all of this comes into, yes, there was a value there, right? There's a hell of a lot more value in the amount of time and, and, and enjoyment you're going to get out of a game that you really like and enjoy and feel a part of than, say, a sparkly horse. From, from Diablo 4. I'm sorry, Blizzard, you keep catching strays, but you kind of deserve it. But all of this doesn't even include some of the things that were there. There were actually, believe it or not, microtransactions within MMOs decades ago. They were just basically microtransactions to transfer a server, or maybe to change the name of your character, or to change the gender or race of your character. Those microtransactions were normally around like $20, $50. They were, they were not cheap. I remember a couple times when I had to transfer server on EverQuest and that shit was expensive. I remember a couple times when my friends made me do it on WoW and I still don't forgive them. <laughs> but before we get into all this, I don't want this to come off as some anti-developer rant. That's not what we're talking about here. This is more just like a look at the state of the genre and some of the things that I find particularly gross about it, like the things that we're talking about with price anchoring and all that bullshit. No, the, I understand how that gaming costs have gone up. Gaming costs are very expensive and MMOs are perhaps one of the most, if not the most expensive games to make. 
They are huge, sprawling things with massive server costs, and you have way, way, like so many freaking variables when it comes to making them. Player behavior is ridiculous. I mean, honestly, if I was a game dev, I would only consider making an MMO that relied on user generated content like a PvP first MMO or an, a sandbox MMO, because trying to create curated content on that time frame for, for the voracious players that we all are, God, that's tough. So the issue isn't that games cost money. I have no issue with the the expand the, the costs of games, and I do think and this might be unpopular that we are due a raise in the costs. In fact, I know it's unpopular and we'll get to that in just a sec. But I think we're due for a raise in the box price of games and a raise in the, the, the monthly subscription of games. And I say that because they've been the same for a really long time. But the offset of that is we got to get rid of all this bullshit when it comes to all these these duplicitous tactics trying to convince you to spend money that you don't actually want to spend. All these tactics to get you to spend a small amount here, a small amount there, and think that you're actually getting some kind of value when you're not. Things that are done deliberately to make the game worse if you don't pay extra, to get as much money as possible out of a smaller group of players. Not as much money for the value of the game, but as like, Ease the entry, get as many players as you can, and then squeeze a small percentage of them that are willing to pay for whatever you can get from them. The whales. That suddenly, and against all probability, a sperm whale had been called into existence several miles above the surface of an alien planet. But since this is not a naturally tenable position for a whale, this innocent creature had very little time to come to terms with its identity. And this is where it kind of becomes our fault. Ground, that's it, ground. I wonder if it'll be friends with me. Hello, ground. Curiously. And there's two reasons why. Because you see, we actually do purchase these microtransactions at a very high rate. We also, well, I want to talk about this results, this poll results of what I ran on my channel. This poll that I ran that got over a thousand votes, where I essentially said, what is the max you would pay for an MMORPG with zero microtransactions? No cosmetics, no boost, no quality of life, no gear, etc. 53% of you said the exact same thing that we currently have for those, those games that are supposed to be none of those monetization things. $60 for the box and $50 for the sub. The same pricing we've had for over a decade. Over half of you were unwilling to pay anything more the maximum, keep in mind this is the maximum, not, not just saying what you're, not just saying what you would be, what you'd prefer, this is the maximum you would be willing to pay. And yes, this, this poll is, is a, not exactly a huge sample size, it's just, it's, a, it's 1400 people and some of these people may not even play MMOs that are voting. But the fact that there was over half of you saying the, the, this minimum price on this chart was actually something that I found kind of surprising. As we go on down there, we have $70 box and $15 sub, and about, about a quarter of you were willing to pay that, 25%. Go even further, and it really, really drops off. A $70 box fee with $20 sub was only 8%. $80 box with $20 sub was 6%. And the most expensive one had $80 box with 25 sub, and 8% of you were willing to. And some of the comments were actually really telling. $15 is my max on a sub fee. I don't want to feel like I must play an MMO constantly due to a higher sub. $60 to $70, no subscriptions. I am not buying a game I have to keep paying for. The comments went on going on to say things like how that the, uh, basically a subscription is nothing more than a cash grab and that it makes you feel like you have to play the game because you're paying a subscription fee. And I think it kind of shows just how well, how well the advent of the free to play model, which actually used to be considered kind of the death knell of an MMO, the free to play when when a game went free to play, that meant it was in, in, its, in its death throes. It was struggling a lot. Well, now it's it is the default in a lot of ways. It is the expected model for a lot of players or perhaps something more on, along the lines of something like Guild Wars 2, where you pay a box fee, no subscription, but you have a cash shop. 
And then I land on this last comment. The whole point of microtransactions is that you don't have a system like a sub. Digest that how you will. MMOs, when they succeed, are huge returns on investment for the companies that make them. And we're going to use an example of that with Star Wars The Old Republic, because it's the only game where we have some decent numbers for it. And GameSpot did a good deep dive on it back when it was first announced, that the game had made 1 billion in lifetime revenue. Billion, with a B. It's not the only one either, I believe EverQuest has also made a billion in lifetime revenue as of uh, 2020 from their, their from the bookings that they gave us in from EG7 back in 2020. Star Wars The Old Republic reportedly cost $200 million to make over six years with 800 staff putting in work to bring the vision to life for Bioware and EA. It launched in 2011 and eight years later in 2019 on an earnings call, Electronic Arts reported the game had made nearly a billion dollars in revenue. Something they said was a business that just keeps on going. We like those types of businesses. Remember how I was saying that every game now wants to be a live service game? Well, this is kind of why. It's a business that just keeps on going. It just keeps printing money. I think the caveat there is it has to be successful. And there's a big, big bet whenever you make an MMORPG. It's a whole lot of work that comes before you make any, any money on it at all. MMORPGs are incredibly expensive to make and they take a very long time. Remember, like, look back at what I just said about Star Wars Republic. $200 million to make, six years to make, and 800 staff to make. That is a tremendous investment. And you don't know until the game launches if it's going to be worth anything. It could be a lost six years of development time if it just flops. The hope is that you get a game that goes on and on and on and is is a constant as a constant revenue source, which is not always going to work out that way. And that's not that that's that different from any other game. It's just something to consider that, yes, games are successful, but they're not guaranteed to be successful, especially in the MMORPG space. As you know, about 20 or 30 or 50 or hundreds learned really since World of Warcraft launched and everyone tried to do the same thing. Now, of course, with this $1 billion and the $200 million, one of the things that's not included in this, this calculation are the operating costs. But the number itself is significant because it has referenced another article from Business Insider back in 2010 that quoted an astronomical sum for World of Warcraft at its height. $1 billion per year in revenue. For World of Warcraft at its height, a billion per year. And at its height, you really have microtransactions. There's also another interesting connected tissue between these both of these games. Well, they diverge a little bit, but they both actually started out as box plus sub, and that was it. No crazy microtransactions. But one of them took a quick turn. My life spans millennia. Legions have risen to test me. War is not going well for Republic forces. We fought too hard to let the Empire beat us. The circle closes. The end begins. They've also both moved away from that. Star Wars The Republic did much more drastically, going free to play with a premium subscription and cosmetic store in November of 2012. Less than a year from its launch, it abandoned its model and leaned into what at the time was one of the worst absolute worst free-to-play models to date. It's been improved over the years, but it was riddled with suffocating restrictions on funds, interactions with others, gameplay, PvP, basically anything you could restrict, they did. And they added cosmetics to the store, boosts, single-use packs to get around the restrictions. It became a nightmare of monetization, one that immediately turned me off of the game. And they did it all less than a year from launch. But kind of worked for them, right? Because they made a billion dollars. Of course, it may not have been continuing to work for them because, well, they have now been punted off to Broadsword, which no offense to Broadsword, but they're not known for developing any games. They're known for being a steward for games that are in maintenance mode, like Ultima Online, which has been 
at some point maybe possibly getting a new a new dawn server but we haven't seen anything for a while and dark age of camelot so interesting interruption here because i made this this comment about broadsword and ultima online and them not really essentially being ready to to provide any kind of new content and as i was saying that in this video we got announcements that the new legacy or new new dawn whatever the new server the new shard from ultima online is actually moving forward and we should have beta testing this summer. So I guess Broadsword is, is doing better than I thought. But WoW, WoW is still successful, right? And they still have a box and sub price. They are still a standard for the box and sub. I think the first sparkly horse and, and wow is going to go down in history that and and the horse the horse armor are going to be like go down in history as as some of the key key moments of, of microtransactions and mmos yeah here's the biggest sadness dude i worked two years of overtime straight on starcraft 2 wings of liberty starcraft 2 wings of liberty made less money than the horse the first sparkle pony horse in World of Warcraft, a $15 microtransaction horse made more money than StarCraft 2. That's it. That's the whole meme, dude. You're wondering why these companies do microtransactions? Because dipshits keep buying all of them. You're wondering why companies do microtransactions? Because dipshits keep buying all of them. That was from Pirate Software. Pirate Software was kind enough to give me permission to use that clip explaining from his own ex own perspective which was unique perspective because he worked for blizzard how a sparkly horse made more money than a hotly anticipated game you know i think that pirate software is onto something with this way of delivering information so that's the what the way that i'm going to do it for this next part here as we dive into this freaking ridiculous microtransaction we're just gonna hide my face when, he, when we do it all right so basically, World of Warcraft released their first microtransaction Celestial Steed back in 2010. I have terrible handwriting, sorry. And they had a queue of when they when they released it in 2010, they had a queue of 140,000 people. 140,000 people wanted this freaking sparkly horse. Is this a horse? Let's do a horse. This is a horse. Nay. Yay. And then let's add some sparkles. I guess we add a tail. So they wanted this horse and this horse was actually going to cost them $25. $25 for this horse. If you take this all at face value, well, then you basically get a $3.5 million balance from this sparkly horse. And all of this took them three hours. And before all this, of course, they had already been dealing with some kind of like microtransactions with little cosmetic pets. You know, little cute things like this, little cat meow. That was that was already something they were doing. They're selling it. They were doing these for about nine dollars. They'd already dipped their hands in, but now they realized we'd buy it. Okay, I'll be honest. When I put that in the script, I thought it wouldn't be too bad, but damn, Pirate Software does that shit live, and it is it is it was difficult for me, and I wasn't even showing my face. I was taking a lot of pauses. <laughs> props props to Pirate Software. He is a smarter man than me. Now, it's only gotten worse since then, of course. World of Warcraft has added the WoW token. Other subscription-based games like EverQuest and Lord of the Rings Online went free to play and piled in microtransactions for cosmetics, experience boosts, and level boosts. Entire video essays have been done on, hor on the horrors of Neverwinter's microtransactions and an internet firestorm started around Diablo Immortal. Remember, remember Diablo Immortal? That one that Diablo Immortal that everyone was talking about? Well, it, it, it made... It made $525 million in one year, as reported by Games Hub. Now, Statista shows a huge crash in revenue for the game, but it's still making a couple million per month two years later. Blizzard wasn't quite so egregious with their microtransactions in Diablo 4, but they were still present. They've also gone on to add WoW tokens in classic World of Warcraft, a controversial, potentially pay to win transaction. It often feels like MMOs and really the gaming industry at large have learned that a minority of players are willing to spend money and that minority of players are kind of going to be a huge benefit to the company monetarily. So let's go back, for example, and don't worry, I won't bring out the MS Paint again. 
But to that little sparkly horse, the, the Celestial Steed, and how it sold, it made, for, for layman's terms, $3.5 million uh, for, by selling it at $25 million. 3.5 million in three hours. Well, how does 3.5 million for a sparkly horse work out to, well, subscription fees? At $15 a month, you roughly need about 233,000 people paying for per month to equal what the horse made in three hours. So to offset that, just to kind of show how big of a thing it is here, to offset those 140,000 people, you got to lose 233,000 people, at least for a single month. It obviously changes as you go in month to month, but just that that little horse makes a big deal. And the cost to make the horse is, of course, going to be negligible compared to the cost of making the game. It's honestly going to be for a lot of developers a bit of a no brainer, as long as they can find the balance of making something that people will buy and not pissing players off enough that enough of them realizing that it's going to be a multiplier on how much because of the people buying the thing would need to leave. Simply put, again, the math just isn't in your favor if you don't like microtransactions. You're fighting an uphill battle. That's largely why we lost. And obviously, because WoW has doubled and tripled and quadrupled down on things since selling that Celestial Horse, I think we can say that they have found a nice area for themselves where, yeah, they know they're pissing off some players, but not enough for it to matter. But I don't want to leave this with just all doom and gloom. I'd suggest that for the last 10 to 15 years, there ha it has been a bit of a testing ground for microtransactions. Companies at times have pushed too far, and some have paid for it. Star Wars The Old Republic alone is an example of how they've evolved. Their free-to-play model much improved from its early days due to player backlash, and I assume sagging revenue. Not too long ago, RuneScape backed down from some brutal monetization changes, and Lord of the Rings Online spent over a year giving away previously paid for content to increase player numbers. And those, those things that I mentioned with EverQuest 2, at least one of them, the pay for raid, has been completely rescinded. There hasn't been anything as of this video about the new one, but you know, enough pushback and maybe they'll pull that too. They also haven't put that stuff in EverQuest yet. So was the war against microtransactions lost? Yes, in a, in a way it was, we have ceded a shit ton of ground. But I also think we need to be aware of where this genre came from and how it was already a very, very expensive hobby to have. But I also think that we have at this point a couple of companies that are riding off of, you know, uh, not necessarily goodwill, but good reputation. Reputation born from nostalgia, games that we really liked in the past, games that 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 come out with no real substance to them. The games that are, are not well received or don't have that history. Well, they don't they don't tend to do that well. And in fact, two of the things that may doom the upcoming MMORPGs this year, Throne and Liberty and Blue Protocol, might actually be aggressive monetization. As players, our red line on what we consider pay to win, what we consider unacceptable when it comes to microtransactions has moved. It has moved over and over and over again. And I, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that I hasn't moved for me, it has. When I was younger, I wanted no microtransactions whatsoever. And now I definitely am, I have, I have, I don't really have many problems with an experience boost here or there. And that actually worries me more than you might think. Why don't I? And part of that could simply be because I play games that existed before the experience boost. So I don't play games that have been, let's say, built around the the need for experience potions, because that's a thing that happens, too. But I think the most important thing in this ongoing battle, if we if we will, against uh, microtransactions is you yourself finding out what your red line is, but perhaps more than anything else, understanding and learning what some of the marketing tactics they are using to get you to pay more money. Because if, if there's any takeaway from this video, realize that there are psychological tactics being used to encourage you to spend more money. And I think that there's no greater video for this in this space than this video over here, which gives kind of a general overview. And yes, this is not me tossing to another one of my videos. I'm tossing to a video from Josh Drive Hayes. And I was gonna do the Neverwinter video, but that's that's pretty deep 
in-depth and never winter specific, so I figured this one might be a good start. 